In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last Sunday evening, I reminded you of the definition of a saint that I learned when I was at Sunday school. A saint is someone who knows that they are a sinner. There is another definition that originated in a church like ours that had beautiful stained glass windows filled with many images. The priest asked the children to describe a saint, and one little girl excitedly pointed to the windows and said, A saint is someone the light shines through. And not just sunlight. I am reminded of the words that are used when the baptismal candle is given to the newly baptized in this church. Receive the light of Christ, so that when the bridegroom comes, you may go forth with all the saints to meet him and see that you keep the grace of your baptism. The baptismal candle is, of course, lit from the great Paschal or Easter candle. At the Easter Vigil, we renew our baptismal vows as we did this morning. But at the Easter Vigil, how significant that the very next thing we do is to sing the Litany of the Saints. The great cloud of witnesses, not only to the light of Christ, but through whom the light of Christ shone brightly. It is also significant that the Litany is sung in procession. There is movement. As the celebrant sprinkles the people with water from the font as they carry their own brightly lit candles, it is, I have to say, the most beautiful sight to see this church filled with the saints of God. Thus today, on All Saints Sunday, we celebrate the fact that we are called to be saints, called to be holy. Holiness is a dynamic process. Like the procession at the Easter Vigil, by which we become more Christ-like, or as expressed in that wonderful mural in the Church of St. Gregory of Nyssa in San Francisco, of the dancing saints around the altar. As the theologian Philip Sheldrake once said, holiness is a process, a continual movement toward God. And that kind of movement brings us into a relationship with God that is ever-changing, ever-new. Such a relationship as this broadens our horizons and allows us to see the world as Jesus saw it in his life on earth and how he sees it now after his resurrection and ascension into glory. Living a holy life means being attuned to God's call and allowing that call to change us and make us holy, sanctified in Jesus Christ. And therefore it means living in hope. And living a hopeful life is as important now as it was some 2,000 years ago. In Glasgow, at the moment in Scotland, many world leaders are gathered in a conference organised by the United Nations to discuss climate change and what we can do about it. Now one thing is clear, to change the trajectory of global warming will require many nations to work together, to cooperate. But dare I say it, Many of them seem to lack a common vision of the creation that God has entrusted to our care. We are stewards of this planet because of God's reckless generosity. Let us continue to pray that humanity's reckless stewardship does not continue to destroy our earthly home. As Christians, we live in hope because we know that if the whole world was attuned to God's plan, we wouldn't even need such conferences. The prophecy of Isaiah, we heard earlier in our service, 
spells out what can happen when people are truly attuned to God's plan. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. And the vision of that new creation is quite extraordinary. Of the wolf and the lamb eating together and the lion eating straw. That same theme of the new creation is taken up in the book of Revelation where we hear of a wonderful image of the new Jerusalem prepared as a bride for her husband coming down out of heaven. The choir sang about it so beautifully a few moments ago and how God will dwell with us and wipe away all tears. You see, this image of the New Jerusalem is a sign of how things will be, God's home among mortals. The glory of God is found in the person of Jesus Christ. The holiness of the saints, therefore, is discovering that glory. When Archbishop Michael Ramsey was buried in the cloisters of Canterbury Cathedral, a very simple inscription was put on his stone. One of his favorite quotations from St. Irenaeus in the second century. The glory of God is a living man. But the quote of Michael Ranty Stone is only half of the sentence. And perhaps it's intended as you read it to think, what comes next? Because if we finish the sentence as Irenaeus wrote it, we discover that continual movement towards God allows us not only to become holy, to reflect the glory of God, but also to behold that glory, if you will, to inhabit that glory. Arnais said, the glory of God is a living man, and the life of man consists in beholding God. The life of man consists God. Our journey of life is a discovery that we are most fully alive when we recognize God's image in each of us and search for his presence so that we come to that place where we can behold him face to face. Or as Irenaeus also said, Human beings shall therefore see God in order to live, being made immortal by that sight and even entering into God. Even entering into God. Now this is not something we do on our own, which is why we renew our baptismal covenant together at every baptism with those who have been baptized, and not just at Easter. And we do so with the great cloud of witnesses supporting us and encouraging us to allow God's light, His glory, to shine within each one of us. We need one another. As I've often said to you, at the Eucharist, the celibate prays, therefore with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, he or she does not pray like but with. The communion of saints is relational and dynamic, stretching across time and uniting heaven and earth. Preaching on this same passage from Hebrews at All Saints Margaret Street some years ago, Archbishop Rowan Williams pointed out an almost throwaway line which you may have missed when you heard the second lesson today. It's quite remarkable. After listening to all the great figures of Israel's history, all the kings, the prophets, and the amazing priests and people, 
The writer says this, without us, they will not be made perfect. Could it be that they need us as much as we need them? Rowan Williams said this, think of that in our own terms. Without us, Francis of Assisi will not be made perfect. Without us, St. John of the Cross will not be made perfect. Without us, Mother Teresa will not be made perfect. Surely some mistake, as the editors say. But no, these great witnesses become perfect. They become fully into their life that God purposes for them. When we respond, when we enter into a relationship with them, so that the way in which they have made God credible comes alive in us. What this means, my friends, is that our search for holiness is made more credible, not only by the presence of those who have gone before us, but by those with whom we walk today. As William said, they become fully into their life that God purposes for them when we respond, when we enter into a relationship with them. It is a movement that allows the church to become holy, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Since its members are holy, united in God's love. It is ultimately what we mean by the communion of saints, a continuum of those who have gone before, who have run the race, and those who are still running towards the prize, uh, but not the New York Marathon kind of prize. The glory of God that will make us fully alive. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.